I'm kind of the opposite, and people I think think that I am. Um, I think they just want me to insult them because so many things that I've done in Deadpool, it's just the whole run of me insulting Ryan Reynolds. All through Silicon Valley, I was always insulting. So I think people think if they yell stuff out, they'll. And it happened more. It's happened less now that I've become, I guess, more famous, or people are just like, don't, that, that's not okay to rub. Used to happen all the time, every single show. But now, yeah, if people yell, they kind of want to be involved. And I'm very quick, because I started out as an improviser, I'm quick to go into the crowd to talk to people. And that's what's so weird about this special, Dear Jonah, because I did this, I have these specials that are coming out that are all completely improvised stand-up. So it's where the audience gives suggestions for names of jokes, and that wow. becomes my set list. And then uh, they, I have a projector, and they throw up the name. It could be whatever, like Karl Marx farts or something like that. And the first <laughs> time I see it is the first time the audience sees it, and then I turn around and do a joke, completely improvised right off of that. When I finish, they throw up the next joke. And so I started as an improviser. That's really fun for me. Are you committing yourself to putting this out, like regardless of how it goes? Or yeah, totally. And well, and what you do is you get rid of the stuff that absolutely didn't work. But yeah, you have to have some things that show you fumbling and not doing well. Right. But for the most part, the audience is just amazed that you can even do it in general. That you right. can present something. So when it's really funny, then they're just like, "What the fuck just happened?" I mean, I'm amazed. And. Um, but I do a lot of crowd work. I speak with the audience. I'll, I talk about my day. I have a lot of stuff online that's kind of, I show up in Winnipeg and just talk about Winnipeg and what happened that morning. And it's just, it's all improvised. The audience loves it. So I love to throw that stuff up. But in Dear Jonah, the strangest thing happened, which is, so when you film a special, you know this, when you film a special, you have to do two different shows, usually right. two different shows, a theater or something. And then you pick the best one and then use that as the foundation. And you and patch up any little exactly. issues with the other show. So I figured out a way to shoot these specials so that they're television quality, but I can shoot four shows or five shows. So I did four shows in Nashville. And the first show went pretty well. We're like, ah, we don't have it at all. It's just me warming up. And then the second show, you know, Late Show Friday, sometimes you're like, oh, this is going to be a disaster. People are yeah. so drunk. And also, it is the worst. And people are so drunk uh, in Nashville. So I said, if I get out there and they're just a mess, I'm just going to riff and we'll have that on. And the director said, no, 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 honestly, we don't really have it at all. So just do the exact special again. And hopefully we get a couple of good things. Then we'll, we'll bank those. I said, we'll see what happens. So I go out and I start performing. And it's the best audience. It's such an amazing audience. I'm like, how is this possible? That sec somehow it felt like these people had drank perfectly. <laughs> they were absolutely all professional drunks, which is, I guess, Nashville. It's either a bachelorette party or just pro drunkards. And I'm performing, and I'm like, this is it. This is special. I mean, this this is the audience that I want for the special. And then this fucking guy in the front row starts just talking. And I was like, oh, why is this guy heckling? And it, it was weird. You know how when you're really drunk, but you have audience members that are drunk and they're not trying to be mean or anything. They're just drunk in a way that they forget there's other people and it's just Steve-O and them in their living room and they're listening. And so they'll just talk to you. And so he started doing that. He was like, oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm good. That was good. And I was just like, God damn it. So I ignored him for a little while. Because he was fucking up the special. I mean, he's talking, it's was he messing front with row? my he was front he was frontist row. He was the most front. <laughs> he was practically on the fucking stage. Really, his he could have leaned his chin down and he was on the stage right there. So it's like, all right, what am I gonna do? I've gotta just talk to him. I'm gonna try and shut him down, and then I'm gonna move on, you know, and then get back into what I wanna do, which is film this special that I, it was gonna be called the pandemic special to show people what I was doing during the pandemic. Right, and, it, and it's, it's particularly difficult when you're doing crowd work on camera to pull in anything from another show because you've got different audience members. And for the rest of the show, if you call back to that person, you can't, you, you can only use that thing in right. that show. So yeah, you're totally fucked, kind of. So I said, all right, I'm just gonna talk to him, get it done, and move on. And so he's right in the front row. So he's wearing cargo pants. 
And I go, oh, are you wearing cargo pants? What kind of cargo you got? What are you, what are you, what are you hauling? What's your freight, you know? And he starts to talk about cargo pants, and he's like, I, 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 I just like cargo pants, even though I don't keep anything <laughs> in them. And so it's immediately clear he's developmentally challenged. This guy is like, you know. Yeah. He is not, he's not a drunk heckler. Let me put it that way. That is not what was happening. Right. And so there's this moment where he finishes that thing and you can feel the audience is like, Ooh, what is TJ going to do? Because <laughs> it's a real moment. Am I going to, lots of comedians would just be like, oh, 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 you know what I, mean? I like cargo pants. You could absolutely have done that. But that's not me. And so I just took a beat. And I just turn to the audience and I'm like, I want all of you to know that I am not going to make fun of him at all. And they just erupt. Everyone's laughing and clapping and stuff because then everyone can just relax and this, this kid can relax too. And then throughout the show, he starts to come back in. I like ask him some questions, I do this. At one point he just, I say something, it's quiet and he's like, Hilarious! It's hilarious! And I was like, it is hilarious. <laughs> and as the show goes on, he becomes more and more incorporated into it until by the end of the show, by the end of the special, he's kind of the star of it. And so I changed the name of it from the pandemic special to Dear Jonah because it sort of ended up being a love letter to this guy who I'm sure, and he's the hugest fan of mine. He just loves it. And he says that a couple times in the show. And the, the closer of the show, I involve him, and there's this guy who's a total idiot, fucking this guy named Trevor, which is the perfect name for this dude when you see the special. And, you know, I mean, it's you gotta see it, but it's unlike anything else, because no one's ever had something like this happen, and even if they did, they would cut it out, probably. Mm -hmm. Right. Or they would move away from it, right? Which is hilarious, because now there's this whole ableist thing, and they're saying you can't say spaz, and all those sorts of things. And so a lot of people said to me, well, you shouldn't, you should probably cut that out. I was like, why would I cut that out? That's ableist, that's not including. I wanted to include him in the conversation. He was the show, he ended up being the best part of the show. And so that was the craziest experience for me of a heckler. Right. Because I thought I was being heckled and it turns out being something completely different. And so throughout the whole 45 minute special, you're just like, you kind of halfway through start to be like, where's Jonah? I want to see Jonah do some stuff again. And then he does. It's amazing. Yeah, if only I had hecklers like that. I've just got absolute shitheads. Oh, I've got those too. <laughs> and then you just got to tear them apart. And I get some really entitled white women yelling shit and getting upset at me. That's actually in the special also. But um, yeah, usually you got to shut them down and make fun of them. Right. My technique always is to like, contextualize their behavior, like recontextualize. So somebody will be like, wasn't that funny or something like that. I'm like, God, you would be a great dad. You know what I mean? Somebody comes back with their, look, dad, yeah. look what I drew today. Well, not that good. I get to give you a beer and get the fuck out of the way of the television. <laughs> so you kind of, you know, you get it right. from that angle sort of. But this was a great example of how I do crowd work, but it also kind of shows that I'm a good guy. I think, you know, there's some there people that go. are like, oh, he seems like an asshole. Seems, and it's really, you can tell in the special that like, all I want is for this to go <clears throat> well for this kid. And, yeah. for every, and it's, it ends up being so great. He showed up at 4 p.m. He was the first person in line, biggest fan. And that's why he was sitting this close to yeah. the stage. Cause he got there and I, I thought he was with his family and I later found out that they were just people at his table who had befriended him, that his family had dropped him off and that he had seen me before, found this out afterwards, and he uh, was in the back of the room and he liked it so much that he decided in his mind, I like him so much, I'm gonna sit as close as possible as I can. And they also, the, the uh, venue, Zany's, the comedy club, mm -hmm. They said um, that he asked, can I get closer to the stage? How, how actually physically close can I get to the stage? So it's amazing. It's like such yeah. a bizarre thing that happened. And that could have happened any single night of my life as a performer, any of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows I do. And it just happened to be on the night that I had a six camera shoot and was filming the audience. So we caught everything from him. It's pretty, it's pretty special, pretty awesome. Yeah, and, people say they tear up at the end of it. Some people are like, it's almost, because it's like emotional at the end. You're like, cool. God, this it. is great. Yeah, you got to yeah. check it out. I think that 
clip was awesome, but not as awesome as my new book, A Hard Kick in the Nuts, What I've Learned from a Lifetime of Terrible Decisions. My first book's five-star rated on Amazon, and I have no doubt this one will be too. So get the autographed copy right now at stevo.com. Yeah, dude.